Welcome everyone to the Tenement Museum's book talk this evening, featuring Five Points, the 19th century New York City neighborhood that invented tap dance, stole elections, and became the world's notorious slum. I'm Dave Favaloro, Senior Director of Curatorial Affairs, and I'm glad to be with you virtually tonight. Thank you again for tuning in. Before we get started, if you're watching this event live, you can ask questions and make comments. Uh, throughout in the chat for our speaker and our um, participant this evening. We'll have dedicated time, of course, at the end of the talk this evening uh, to answer those questions, but please feel free to ask them and pose them throughout the event as they come to you. If you're not familiar with the Tenement Museum, we're a museum that tells stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in the United States, and we're a history museum located on New York's Lower East Side. Uh, the stories we tell are rooted in the intersection of migration and urban life at the neighborhood level, uh, where the lived experience of newcomers helped shape a distinct sense of place. Indeed, visitors to the museum have often asked how the lives of Five Points residents compare to those who called the Lower East Side home uh, during the same, the same periods in the 19th century and, of course, beyond. So we're extremely excited to have Tyler Ann Binder with us. Uh, about his book, Five Points. And of course, it's the 20th anniversary of its publication. So it's even more uh, special to, to have you with us uh, tonight. So welcome, Tyler. Uh, before we get started, please be aware that Five Points is currently available for sale in the Tenement Museum online shop. A link will be provided in the chat where you can access uh, the online shop and purchase the book if you like. Uh, and so now officially, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker tonight. Tyler Ann Binder is Emeritus Professor of History at George Washington University, where he taught courses on history of American immigration and the American Civil War era. He is the author of three award-winning books, Nativism and Slavery, The Northern Know-Nothings and the Politics of the 1850s, Five Points, the 19th century New York neighborhood that invented tap dance, stole elections, and became the world's notorious, most notorious slum course, the subject of our uh, discussion this evening, and more recently, City of Dreams, the 400-year epic history of immigrant New York. Uh, Professor Ann Binder has won two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and served as the Fulbright Thomas Jefferson Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Utrecht, uh, and he is currently working on a project entitled The Great Famine and the Making of Irish New York, a History of Irish Famine Refugees in New York City and Beyond. So uh, we'll touch on five points and some of the other work you've um, uh, undertaken throughout your career this evening, but um, welcome, Tyler. It's great to have you. Thanks. I always enjoy visiting the Tenement Museum, either in person or on Zoom. Great. <laughs> um, well, Clearly so much uh, overlap, I think, between the stories we tell at the Tenement Museum and the stories you tell in Five Points, as well as some of your other work. Uh, but, you know, given the fact that it's the 20th anniversary of the publication of Five Points, I wanted to begin by, you know, asking a little bit about um, what, what sparked the idea for the book for you, what motivated you to sort of write a book at the, about this you know, quote unquote, notorious New York City neighborhood. Um, and, you know, yeah, what did, what did you think there was to learn by by sort of focusing so um, intensively and, and so so much in depth about, you know, this single, this single um, uh, neighborhood in, in historic neighborhood in, in Manhattan in New York City? Well, the idea from the book came from from my first book. So my first book was a history of the anti-immigrant Know Nothing Party, which became very powerful for a while in the 1850s. And, you know, they elected 100 members to Congress, they elected half a dozen governors, uh, and they became a real power for a couple of years, right at the height of the Irish famine immigration. And so having written a book that that focused on what nativists thought of immigrants and gave you know 300 pages of space to an airing of their views, I felt like it was only fair to tell the, the Irish immigrants story from their point of view. And so then I naively, I looked around for, I, I thought, well, I, I can't do something too big. So I thought maybe a neighborhood study would 
makes some sense. And I actually started off thinking I might just do a history of a single block, but that turned out to be not feasible. But then, you know, one of the really important things for historians like me is, is the ideas we get from our colleagues. And uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Wyoming, where I taught then, Ron Schultz, I, I told him I'm looking for a neighborhood. I'm not sure what to do. And he suggested five points, which I had never heard of in this would have been 1993 or 1992 when he suggested this. And I, so I looked into it and I found, wow, in the 19th century, this was this infamous uh, neighborhood. And yet I had never heard of it. And I was a specialist on 19th century America. And the more I looked into it, the more I thought it would be a, a, a great book subject. I say naive because I thought, oh, here's a neighborhood who's, that was you know, four blocks wide and six blocks high. How much can there be? And in fact, when I first told people I was going to do it, people said, uh, that, that can't be done. Those people left no records. They, they weren't important enough to have, you know, paper collections and archives. And, and, and so it won't be possible. But that made me think, oh, good, this will be a thin, a thin volume. I can write it quickly. Um, but it turned out the more I dug, it turned out that, that, that they had left lots of information. It was just not in the places you might usually expect. So instead of going, say, to the New York Historical Society to look at the manuscript collections like you would to, to look up the his, to write the history of a mayor or a political party, I would go to the police records and find the affidavits that people who lived in Five Points, you know, gave when they were testifying against their neighbors for one crime or another. And the, how, the city housing department records, which had great material on the tenements where the five pointers live. And, and so I was able to, to piece the story together and end up finding not only enough, but way more than enough. And so, so I ended up with a, not a thin volume, but I hope uh, a, still an enthralling volume. Yeah, I think that's one of, you know, I think we'll, um, we'll sort of get into some of this, but I think, um, you know, you're mentioning some of the source material, the variety of records that you looked at, which, um, you know, were not immediately things that came to mind. I think, as you said before, uh, you, you began the study. You know, one of the things I think that's so interesting about the story of Five Points, and, and that's a, a thread that um, is woven throughout the book, is, um, you know, separating the sort of the myth of the five points from the reality and, and of course where those intersect. So, you know, we'll, I think we'll, um, we'll kind of get into that because I think it's a really sort of interesting question, but, you know, for uh, viewers who are not familiar with um, the five points, maybe, you know, folks uh, like you were saying yourself when you, you hadn't um, been that familiar with the neighborhood back now, uh, you know, many, many decades ago, if you wanted to, to kind of begin by, um, you know, sort of painting a picture for us of the five points, what the neighborhood was like um, during the 19th century, which of course is the heart of the book, uh, you know, who lived there, what did the streetscape look like, anything I think that, you know, would give viewers a sense of, um, you know, not, not, we're not expecting, of course, um, uh, the, the book in, um, uh, in, in brief, but of course, yeah, if you could just kind of give us a sense of, of the neighborhood and, and its history and, and get, us, get us started. Sure. Why don't you put up the first image sure. that we have, because that will help me paint the picture. Great. So this is a painting of five points that was done in uh, about 1829, just when the neighborhood was becoming famous. And so, to, you know, to answer your question, what it was like to live in Five Points. So a couple of things would have stood out and you can see them in this painting. So one is that it was very crowded. It was the most crowded neighborhood in New York. And it was so crowded because the poorest New Yorkers lived there. And so they crammed into its tenements. Now, notice when we here in 1829, when the neighborhood first becomes infamous, that a, a tenement was not in those days a brick building five or six stories with a fire escape on it. These buildings that you can see here in the painting, which are all two and a half stories, they're kind of two stories plus, a, plus an attic with a dormer window up there. Those were called tenements or, or at this point tenant houses, which would eventually be at, uh, get shortened to tenement houses. Um, but the original owners, for, for the original owners, these had been single family homes. And you might have a shoemaker who, uh, 
who uh, had the shoe shop in the front and then the family lived in the back and maybe the shoes were made up above. But eventually New York became so crowded with immigrants after the War of 1812 that New Yorkers, uh, the owners of these uh, buildings found that they could uh, do a lot better financially if they subdivided their houses into apartments, mostly in this case, one room or sometimes two room apartments and rent each room to a different immigrant family. And so this is when tenements get created. So, so one aspect of living in Five Points is it was very crowded. Another aspect of living in Five Points that made it kind of infamous is because it was the place where the poorest New Yorkers lived, you had a mixing of the races that was unusual for the rest of the city. So you can see in the painting, uh, you know, if you kind of look in the foreground there, just to the left with the man, to the left of the man with the top hat, you see African Americans and you see plenty of African Americans in, in the painting. So the reason the poorest New Yorkers lived in Five Points was because originally there was a lake basically the, in the left hand of the painting around what's now Center Street in Manhattan. Center Street was called Center Street because it ran down the center of where the lake had been. And it was the biggest freshwater body in Manhattan. And eventually the city uh, decided to, to fill in the lake to build more housing. But the housing they built over the lake because the, the lake was fed from beneath, it became very unstable very quickly. So the houses very quickly started to, uh, started to sink and seep and, and tilt. And in addition, in those days, people not knowing about bacteria and viruses, they thought that diseases came from things like vapors and miasmas. And so they didn't want to live any place damp. And so since Five Points basements were so damp, people who could afford to live in better places wouldn't live there. So only the poorest of the poor, the city's African-Americans and poor Irish immigrants moved to Five Points. Then another thing you would have seen in Five Points compared to say today is it was pretty dirty. Notice in the painting, the hogs uh, in, in uh, going around the neighborhood eating the garbage. There's no garbage collection run by the city in those days. That doesn't start until the 1880s. Um, now, and so pigs did a lot of the garbage removal, but the pigs were actually owned by the people who lived in the neighborhood. This was a common thing in Ireland. If you were poor and wanted to make a little money, you would buy a piglet. You would send it out during the day to eat garbage. And then when it got fattened up, you'd sell it to a butcher and make some extra money. And then finally, another thing, just, I mean, I could go on forever talking about this uh, painting, but if you look in the very upper right-hand corner of the painting, you see the woman there with her cleavage showing. So Five Points was famous because it was full of brothels. So this was the red light district of New York uh, throughout the pre-Civil War period, famous for its brothels. And so if you were a well-to-do New Yorker, you would go to this neighborhood to find a prostitute if that was the kind of thing you were looking for. And, and so for all those reasons, the crowding, the dirt, the brothels, um, the pigs, uh, the immigrants, uh, for all these reasons, Five Points became very notorious. One of the, um, you know, it, it, I, I think, as you said, you could go on um, exploring and sort of uh, unpacking what's going on in this, um, in this painting for uh, for quite some time, and I think it's so uh, so rich um, in terms of what's what's occurring in the scene here. One of the things that um, struck me, I was wondering uh, about, are some of these um, individuals um, at the in the sort of foreground here. Uh, looks like they have like a top hat, and they look sort of like they're a little bit. Um, uh, more um, well-to-do or upper class. Is that what, what's the, is there a story with them here? So the, you know, those people are there for probably one of two reasons. So, so either they've ventured over from Broadway, which is a couple of blocks west to, uh, to patronize one of the brothels. The other possibility is that they are doing what, uh, something that whose, whose name had just been coined then uh, known as slumming where you would go to a place like Five Points and ogle the, uh, you know, the poor people and, and uh, take in their, you know, their, the colorful scenes of their drunkenness and, and, uh, and so-called misery. So it became a, Five Points became a tourist attraction in the city right around this time. And uh, 
you know, the very earliest travel logs of New York from the early 19th century, always the people will go to five points. Um, and so, so people as, you know, international tourists, Davy Crockett, later on, Abraham Lincoln, when he goes to New York for the first time says, I have to go to five points. And so it was, it was a, a tourist stop that pretty much everybody made. Now, at this point, you can see the, the well-to-do people are kind of on their own. By the time you get to the 1850s, it was considered de rigueur that if you went to Five Points, you would hire a policeman to take you on a tour to ensure your safety. Mm. But, but that would be what those top-hatted people are, are shown as. Now, of course, you also should keep in mind that you didn't have to be, so in those days, everybody who could afford a, a nice hat wore a hat like that. So that's not just like the millionaires who wear the top hats, right? So if you've seen the gangs of New York, right? Daniel Day-Lewis wears that kind of hat. He's no, he's no upper class person, but that was, that was the stylish hat in those days, if you could afford a stylish hat. So middle class and higher would be wearing that kind of hat. This, um, you mentioned this painting is, um, you know, captures the five points in 1829. But, you know, one of the things I think is um, Im important uh, sort of generally when, when um, you know, exploring the history uh, of the city, um, particularly at the neighborhood level, uh, but I think it's really one of the um, uh, most interesting parts of the book is that, you know, it's, it's clear that, that five points is not a, or was not a static, um, entity, right? It was not, um, you know, the five points wasn't frozen in 1829, right? In this scene, it had a kind of history of its own. And so, you know, how did, how did the neighborhood kind of change over time? And what was that like, whether it was, uh, you know, the individuals who called it home, the, um, uh, the built environment, the sort of the streetscape, uh, what was going on there? What was, well, how did, how did, um, you know, maybe five points look differently 30 or 40 years on from when this painting was, um, you know, seen this painting captured, uh, for example. Sure, why don't we go to the next image sure. and we can talk about that. So five points changes in quite a few ways. One of the first things that happens is, so these, these frame two-story tenements are the norm up until about the mid 1840s when the Irish potato famine strikes and um, you know, about half of Ireland's population was totally dependent on potatoes for their sustenance. And when the, the blight comes in 1845 and destroys pretty much all of the potato crop, um, eventually, you know, starvation uh, overwhelms Ireland and about a million, there are 8 million inhabitants of Ireland when the famine starts, about a million of them die. So one in eight people die. Um, another one in eight, uh, come to the United States. So now if you own one of those two-story wooden tenements, it's, it's economically advantageous to tear it down and build a brick tenement like you can see in, the, uh, in this woodcut here. So, so, so that's actually a five-story tenement. You can only see the first three stories there in the image. Um, actually, it's a six-story tenement now that I think of it. And so now on the same 25 by 100 foot plot, that had maybe five apartments when it was a 25 by 25 wooden building. Now you've got a 25 by 50 or 25 by 75 building with four apartments on each floor. So now you've got, you know, in, in this building, 24 apartments. So 24 apartments to rent instead of five before. So as a landlord, that's, that's a much better deal, though you've got to lay out a couple of thousand dollars to, to build your brick tenement. And so the, the neighborhood becomes primarily brick tenements rather than the the wooden ones, though, you, as you can see, this image is from 1867. And if you look on the right there, one of the wooden tenements is still there, but the rest of the block is mostly going to be brick tenements by this point. So that's one facet of the neighborhood that changed. The other facet that changed, and no, notice in this picture, there are no African Americans. So the neighborhood becomes pretty much entirely Irish. So by the 1850s, more than 90% of the adults who live in Five Points are Irish born. Um, and the American born in the neighborhood are almost all the children of Irish immigrants. And so that's another thing that changes in the, in the city overall. In the 1820s, 
every neighborhood pretty much had every socioeconomic group. But during the late 1820s, 1830s, you end up with socioeconomically distinct neighborhoods. So Five Points becomes overwhelmingly a working class neighborhood. Other parts of the city, especially around Fifth Avenue and Broadway become uh, well-to-do neighborhoods. And that was something you hadn't had before. Um, something that stays constant though are, is you know, the high death rate, something I didn't talk about before when I, when I showed that painting, but this is an image actually of a casket being taken mm -hmm. out of this Five Points tenement. And that's a hearse that you see there waiting to take the casket in. So oh, the neighborhood right. remains one, right. The neighborhood remains one where the death rate is much higher than in the rest of the city. And that's in part because um, uh, as a result of the poverty, um, there are more kind of these communicable diseases, especially that are spread through overcrowding because the neighborhood is still the most crowded. So uh, some of those uh, diseases, the, the lung diseases uh, remain very uh, important. Mm -hmm. Lots of people die of things like consumption uh, as it was known. So that remains uh, the same, even though the population becomes kind of mono-ethnic for a while, though mm -hmm. that will eventually change. And in fact, even by this point, by the 1860s, one street, Mott Street, has become uh, a, a Chinese enclave. And so, so it doesn't remain kind of mono-ethnic for very long. Was there something that um, pushed uh, the neighborhoods, uh, African-American or Black population out of the area? Was there, um, yeah, what's the, the history behind, behind that? Uh, story or that phenomenon. So that's, um, why don't you put up the next image and we can talk about that. So that's a, and this is an image of a riot that took place in Five Points in 1857. So th th there's, the answer to your question is complicated. Um, what you have is kind of, you have both both kind of intimacy and animosity between the Irish and African-American population. So, so in the early period, the 1820s, 1830s, the two groups lived together and you might have, you know, so that street I just showed you, Baxter Street uh, with the tenements, that side of the street was the east side of the street, that was the Irish side of the street. Then the other side of that very same street throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s was an African-American enclave. And so you have, Blacks and, and Irish immigrants living together for most of the pre-Civil War period. The intimacy is in part because of the closeness, in part because you have, for instance, in the dance halls of the neighborhood, which it's famous for, you will have, um, you will often have, there'll be certain uh, bars where that are famous for their music and, and dancing and, and very often Blacks and Irish will dance together there. And so it said that, as, as the title of the book says, it said that tap dance is invented in Five Points mm -hmm. when uh, Irish immigrants who are dancing their jigs and other similar high-stepping uh, dances uh, are competing to for kind of bragging rights as the best dancers with the African-American uh, dancers of the neighborhoods whose, whose favorite dances uh, in this period were known as, as various kinds of shuffles. And it's said that one uh, African-American dancer whose uh, stage name was Master Juba kind of combined elements of the African-American shuffle and the Irish-American jigs and created tap dance. And so that's one element of intimacy. And another is the fact that the city has more black men than women. And Five Points has more Irish women than men because a lot of men would leave Five Points and go to the countryside and get jobs digging canals, building railroads. And so what you end up with in Five Points is quite a few um, common law marriages because interracial marriage was illegal between Irish American women and African American men. That was frowned upon by most of the Irish Americans in the neighborhood, but there were certain blocks in Five Points that was kind of known, well, if you're gonna do that, you can live there. Can't live on our block, but you can live over on that block. But then this kind of, uh, th this kind of un uneasy peace breaks down during the draft riots of 1863. During the draft riots, uh, primarily New York's Irish-American residents protest the war and especially how the war 
the Civil War has changed from one to solely put the Union back together into one that will also free the slaves. And so the rioters take out their wrath in particular on New York's African American community. And they chase um, violently uh, black residents out of a lot of the city's neighborhoods. And one of the neighborhoods where that takes place is Five Points. So there had been African-American residents on Baxter Street right up there through 1863. They no longer felt safe living in that overwhelmingly Irish neighborhood after that. And so a lot of blacks leave the city altogether and those who stay will move to the least Irish parts of Manhattan or go to a place like uh, Brooklyn and find non-Irish neighborhoods there or even go to New Jersey or Westchester, what's now the Bronx to escape, uh, to go to where they feel safe. You had um, talked a little bit about the um, phenomenon of quote unquote slumming earlier, which I think is really um, interesting. So I wanna kind of return a little bit um, to that, this idea um, uh, how the, you know, the, the, the Five Points neighborhood became quote unquote notorious, I think, in the, the popular, the public imagination. Uh, one part of the book, I think there's a really great quote um, where you wrote in its heyday, Five Points was the most thoroughly studied neighborhood in the world. Uh, and I think that's really so interesting. And, and so I sort of touched on this earlier, you know, why these folks were so fascinated by the neighborhood. Um, but, you know, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you think that has that sort of shaped um, over time, how the neighborhood was remembered, how we um, understood it both in its day in the 19th century and and I think subsequently right up until the, the present. Well, it's interesting. So. So the neighborhood is very thoroughly studied in the sense that journalists want to go there and see, you know, is it as bad as people say is the big question they want to answer. And, you know, probably the more sensation seeking journalists, the ones who today we would say are seeking clicks, mm -hmm. uh, proverbial clicks, uh, they will play up this, the, the prostitution, the violence, the crime. The more thoughtful journalists uh, come out of there and say, you know, this place isn't really that bad. You know, I've been to London. It's, it's no worse than what I've seen in London or other places. Sure, the people are poor, but they're, they have dignity. They're, you know, they, they have flower pots in their windows. They have tablecloths on their tables. Um, and they're mostly hardworking people. And sure, there are some criminals, but they're the tiny minority, yet they're what the press always writes about. Um, and then, after, you know, in the post-Civil War period, kind of when the social sciences are invented in the late 19th century, a lot of those new social scientists will go to places like Five Points. Uh, and for instance, you know, when they think about, well, how can you cure the problem of the slum? And they'll look at Five Points and, and use it as, you know, an experiment. And so, you know, one example of this is uh, Jacob Reese, who's a, a, a muckraking journalist who says, you know, the problem with uh, the reason tenements are so bad and there's so much uh, um, disease and death is because there's not enough open space. And so we need to build parks in the tenement districts. And so sure. So he pushes and pushes for years and eventually gets uh, the most infamous block of five points. Uh, which was known then as Bandit's Roost, which is between Mulberry and Baxter Street, gets the entire thing torn down and a park built. And he says, let's now see if, if the neighborhood becomes better, if, if, if uh, disease decreases, if crime decreases, and so forth. Um, and, and so that's one way in which people look at that. And then public health becomes a, a discipline in this, uh, in this period. And so the public health practitioners will come to Five Points uh, and neighborhoods like it and, uh, and uh, you know, try things like visiting nurse services and, and things of that sort to, to try to, to uh, prevent disease and death by treating immigrants in their tenements, uh, knowing that they're not likely to go to doctors because they either can't afford them or, or can't speak English well enough to, to, uh, to go to them. And so 
So for reasons like that, Five Points becomes a, a popular place for uh, kind of social science experimentation in a way. <clears throat> Excuse me, it almost sounds like, um, you know, the Five Points was a, a focus, uh, not only of so much attention externally, but was, um, you know, the site of so many, um, you know, you might call them firsts, quote unquote, right? Um, you mentioned Jacob Reese and, you know, arguably the first use of um, uh, photography in, um, you know, sort of journalism and, in, in, um, you know, galvanizing uh, public support for uh, reform in that regard, or um, uh, the um, the arguably perhaps the first slum, quote unquote, slum clearance uh, project that you mentioned that his uh, photography helped um, help sort of push uh, push through in his work, help push through. What was it about five points that that made it the first? I mean, those are just two specific examples, I think. But you know, throughout the book, there are so. Um, you know, in so many ways that uh, the five points seem to be the site of uh, so much um, important sort of change, both in the city and, and I think arguably nationally, right? Right. Why don't we go to the, to the fifth picture? So not the next one, but the one after that, and we can talk this one? about that. Yeah. Okay. So why don't I briefly touch on uh, photography first, because I think that's an important aspect. So here's a photograph of that exact same block that we saw in that image with the casket before. So that there's the uh, five story, not six story tenement uh, that the casket was coming out of. So you see when you when you see a, a, a photograph like this, that the, you know, the the person who made that woodcut in the 1860s was trying to convey mm -hmm. this is a terrible, uh, impoverished neighborhood, but the, the the woodcut has a softness that that doesn't really allow you to convey that. Whereas, you know, the the photograph kind of you know you can see how tumble down those those wooden tenements are, um, how they've literally notice how they've literally sunk beneath the street level. Right now, in truth, that's um, that's they haven't sunk that far. What happened here on on this block, and in fact throughout the neighborhood, was. Uh, one of the things that made Five Points so bad was that the tenements, the tenements um, were not connected to the to the city sewer system initially, and so the outhouses um, uh, in the backyard would would empty into tanks, and the tanks would stay filled in the backyards for weeks or months until somebody, until the building owner hired somebody to empty them out. So that was one of the reasons disease spread so much because the pump from which you pumped your water um, came from the very same backyard where all those privies were. And, and so as these neighborhoods became more uh, disease ridden, the, you know, this, this is why, for example, oh, so the, the uh, when they finally laid the sewer lines rather than dig underneath the cobblestones, they just laid the sewer lines on top of the street and then they put dirt over the over the sewer lines and they raised the level of the sidewalk. So you notice in 1867, there were steps up to that brick tenement. Now there are no steps up to the tenement because those have been mm. buried with the sewer lines. Um, but then getting back to your uh, to the um, why there are so many firsts there. One of the things is so five points is very centrally located. So, you know, um, it's very close to Broadway. It's very close to City Hall, and so it was. It was. It was impossible to ignore the problems there the way they could be ignored in, say, Harlem at this point, or um, uh, you know, the the far west side by the Hudson River docks. You know, it was possible for well-to-do people just to avoid those areas altogether. Um, but Five Points was so central that you went past it all the time, and so. That's one of the reasons it was so popular a place to kind of experiment with these things because mm. it was always within the public view. One of the other, you know, threads I think that um, that runs throughout, and you sort of speak to this, I think, um, you know, directly is you know the ways in which the the sort of the use the quoting because I think you um, you know captured it so so nicely in 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 language. You really argue that the story of the five points is uh, quote 
the, the quintessential immigrant saga uh, and its history is one of both quote misery and achievement. Um, I think that, yeah, that sort of, I think um, really uh, helps capture so many of these strands that you've been sort of teasing out for us this evening. And, you know, curious if you could kind of expand on that a little bit, right? Like what, what was it about um, the things you learned about five points that, that led you to that, that conclusion to sort of make that, I think, um, that statement, that argument? One of the things I was trying to convey in the book was that, yes, life was really hard for an immigrant living in five points. It was terribly crowded. The, the, disease was rampant, we were much, likely, much more likely to die of, of, uh, of some preventable disease living in Five Points than living in other parts of town that were less crowded, that had better sewer connections, mm -hmm. um, that had less poverty. The reputation for a lot of crime was accurate. Um, but at the same time, those weren't things that really characterized the average person who lived in the neighborhood. The average person who lived in the neighborhood lived there because they had no choice. But you know, most people weren't criminals. Uh, most people didn't die of disease. Um, and so while Five Points was a really hard place to live, the people who lived there, um, just like most immigrants, followed the kind of you know, rags to respectability story that you see with immigrants throughout American history. So maybe if you go to the previous slide, we can talk about this a little more. Oh, oh, oh sorry. The other direction. I lost the, <laughs> <laughs> Let me just bring that back up. Sorry about that. That's okay. And so this image we're gonna see is an image from the uh, Emigrant Savings Bank, which was set up just at the southern edge of the Five Points neighborhood, just north of City Hall, um, specifically for Irish immigrants moving to New York during the famine. And it was set up to give those immigrants a safe place to put their money and, and safe meaning in part safe from the criminals who live in, who might live and prey on Five Pointers, um, but also safe in the sense that in those days there's no deposit insurance. So if you put your money in the bank and the bank goes bankrupt, you lose all your money. So the Emigrant Savings Bank was set up by Irish immigrants for Irish immigrants. And the, the bank specifically promised. There we go. There Sorry we go. about that. There's, that's okay. So there's an image of the interior of the bank. Now, if, if you're an expert on 19th century clothing, you'll say, hey, wait, this is from the 1880s. And yes, that's true. So it's a little later <laughs> on. Um, and so the bank specifically catered to Irish immigrants in neighborhoods like Five Points because they promised, unlike regular banks, we're not gonna, we're not gonna invest your money in anything but the most safe investments. So we promise we will never go bankrupt. We will never miss a, an interest payment. And in fact, that's been the case. And, and the Emigrant Savings Bank still exists today. And so one of the interesting things um, looking at the, that, that I found when working on the project was that you know, just as I was finishing up work on the book, the, the records of the bank were discovered, the earliest records. And you could go in and look at the records and see how much money Five Pointers had saved in the bank. And what I found was they were saving surprisingly large amounts of money, even though people thought of them as poor, as uh, you know, destitute, they were actually saving a lot of money. And even, even people who had jobs as day laborers and, and seamstresses and street peddlers were saving surprising amounts of, of money. And so, so, you know, that, that led me to conclude that even though life was hard there, the immigrants were kind of up to the challenge. And, and in part, what kept the immigrants in five points so long was, was not that they could afford to live nowhere else, but that they were consciously choosing to stay in Five Points even when they could afford a better, a quote unquote better neighborhood 
because it was the cheapest place to live and they could save more money therefore. And they could use that money that they save to, you know, in some cases start a business, in some cases as a rainy day fund, because of course there's no unemployment insurance back then. You know, if you're, if, if you're one of these women and your spouse suddenly dies, you know, there's no social security to collect. So it was important to save money in case of death or long-term unemployment. And so people save money for that, to start a business, to send their children to college. Lots of five pointers had children who went to college to, you know, and we're not talking about going to Columbia or Harvard, but they would go to places like Fordham or St. Xavier, which was uh, another, the Catholic school, uh, the Catholic school in Manhattan. And so, so what I found was that despite the reputation, um, five pointers did a lot better than one would expect. They kind of did like all immigrants is they struggled, but they not only got by, but they in the end thrived. And, and that was kind of what led me to that conclusion that, that you had both the poverty, but you also had accomplishment at the same time. That's great. <clears throat> and um, stop sharing the screen there so we can um, uh, come back and um, you know we want to uh, save some time to get to um, viewers questions but um, the immigrant savings bank um, you know is, as uh, I believe you've mentioned to, to me is connected to some of the um, or your study of some of those records is connected to some of the things you're you're looking into now and and um, your new project uh, that, that's looking at um, famine uh, immigrants um, and uh, and and their history here in the city and, and beyond. Just tell us a little bit about um, your work, the new project, and and, and even the, the kind of connective tissues between um, you know the the sort of work on the five points and and some of this more recent stuff you're looking at. Sure. Well. The, the immigrant bank records were to me so interesting that when I finished with five points, I decided to work with them a little more just to see because I, you know, I wanted to know, well, were five pointers exceptional or as, as some people who read the book thought, they said, well, not all Irish immigrants could have done as well as, as these people you talked about in the book. So I tried to do a more kind of exhaustive study. Um, and so I ended up on this project that I've been working on now for a decade where I compiled a, a database of all the depositors at the Immigrant Savings Bank from the 1850s. And then the nice thing is nowadays, you know, whereas 20 years ago, if I wanted to try to track down one of the five points residents uh, in American census records, I would have to go to the National Archives and or New York Public Library. And I'd have to get out an index book and look up a person's name. And if there were 10, say, Patrick Mahoney's, I'd have to get 10 rolls of microfilm and go to 10 different places on each of those rolls of microfilm to find the Patrick Mahoney's and see if I could find the Patrick Mahoney who lived in five points. But now with Ancestry.com, what, you know, that would have taken me a whole morning to look for those 10 Patrick Mahoney's. Now I can find them in 30 seconds on Ancestry.com. And so I hired, thanks in part to the help of the NEH, I was able to, with this project, hire kind of an army of undergraduates and search for 15,000 Irish immigrants who opened accounts at the Immigrant Savings Bank throughout the 1850s, not just from Five Point, but from all over New York and even people who lived in Brooklyn and New Jersey and Staten Island. Mm. And then when it became, you know, we could find some, but couldn't find others. And then I hired a, a genealogist, a professional genealogist to help with the rest. And, and I ended up with so much that, I did, and, and the stories were so rich that I decided that just to look at, you know, just to answer the question, how much, you know, how well financially did the famine immigrants do wasn't, wouldn't do justice to all I, we had found. So I decided to write this, this book that I'm, I'm working on now that is, basically a history of the famine Irish in New York. And so I call it, the, the working title is The Great Famine and the Making of Irish New York. And mm. the way I've organized it is kind of a, a climb up New York's socioeconomic ladder. So it, we start with those who came to New York and initially worked as day laborers and domestic servants. 
Uh, and we follow some of them and some of them never rise any higher on the socioeconomic ladder, but a lot of them move up the, the ladder, um, you know, some only up one rung maybe to become peddlers, but some up a couple of rungs to maybe learn a trade. And then a lot I found, so, so one of the interesting things I found, for instance, is, you know, a quarter of New York's day laborers eventually, of the famine day laborers eventually own their own business. Oh, interesting. Which is something that, that you know, you wouldn't have imagined. Right. And the, the way we find that is because we're, <laughs> what we're doing is tracing, you know, so I'll, if I can find Patrick Mahoney, uh, when he opened his bank account, um, the nice thing is the bank took down all this information about each deposit of their, their spouse's name, their spouse's maiden name, their children's names. And so we can use that information to track them from 1850 when they opened their account to see what they're doing in 1860, to see what they're doing in 1870, if they're still alive. And so we can kind of trace their socioeconomic rise, but sometimes fall um, uh, and kind of, so, so in that way, I, I'm painting a group, kind of a group portrait of the famine Irish in New York and beyond, because a lot of immigrants start in New York, but don't stay in New York and, and will move to other parts of the country, sometimes only as far as Brooklyn or Hoboken, but mm. some to Minnesota, some to California. And so that's Sounds kind of what the project is. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. We can't um, uh, wait to read the book and, and then have you back to ask you questions about it, just like the five points. But, you know, one of the things, um, uh, you, of course, about the, the five points book, this new project, I think um, that resonates so much uh, with us uh, at the Tenement Museum uh, is, you know, the way you're sort of incorporating the stories of these individuals uh, as a way of understanding, um, you know, a larger sort of group experience. So, you know, really fascinating to hear about, um, you know, some of those life histories, some of those stories, uh, and the kind of uh, larger aggregate history of um, of the famine Irish in this case, and 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 the way they shaped um, New York. So, um, very excited to to hear more when um, when when you're ready, of course, but. Um, have some questions from viewers that that we want to be sure to get to uh so i'll i'll sort of dive in and, and kind of ask you some of those and uh feel free to uh to respond uh however you'd like um one uh question um uh that's been submitted uh, asks how accurate was the movie gangs of new york in depicting life in the five points and of course you've mentioned gangs of new york uh the uh, movie that now is I think about 20 years old. I can't remember the, the date when that came out myself, but um, but you might. 2002. Okay, so yeah, right around the same time as the as the book, yeah. That's always the first question I get at the Tenement that... Museum. <laughs> For 18 years, that has always been the first question. Well, you can rely on. <laughs> but I love I love talking about it. Um, so the answer is. It's complicated, and he, you know, there's. Here's what I would say: the so the look of Five Points has been is really well done. Other than maybe the colors of the buildings, where they just since all the images are black and white, they had to guess mm. and they went pretty wild with the colors. I think there's a lot more whitewashing going on in five points of buildings than going for bright paint colors. But other than that, the look is really good. Um, Scorsese was just, you know, went crazy in terms of the clothing people wore. Not only did they copy stuff out of, you know, magazines, um, but they went as far as to use the exact same fabrics. So they got people to weave the fabrics that people wore so that the clothing would sit on their bodies the same way and that they would sweat the same way. And so uh, Scorsese was very fanatical about that. So the buildings look right. The uh, clothing looks exactly right. Where it becomes more complicated is, so, you know, the individual facts in the story are mostly made up. And, you know, so, so Scorsese asked me to read the screenplay and 
point out the historical inaccuracies. And so I did that and I met with him uh, and his team and you know, it would go something like this. So we'd, I'd get to one page of the screenplay and I'd say, um, well, on this page you have, you have this happening here, but that really happened 20 years after the period in which the movie takes place. And Scorsese would say, yeah, I, I know that, but, but still I, I, um, you know, I, I wanna get that into the story because it's part of New York's history. So we're, we're mm -hmm. kind of playing with the timeline. And I'd say, okay, that's fine. And then I'd go to the next page and I'd say, all right, well, here you have this scene here and, 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 and that also definitely wouldn't have happened that way. Um, that, and, and he said, yes, I know that, but that scene appeared to me in a dream and my dreams are really important to me in terms of my artistic vision. And so I, ha I had to do that scene that way because of my dream. Okay, and I go to the next page and I'd say, well, well, this scene definitely wouldn't have happened like this. And here's why I say, yeah, I know that, but that scene is an homage to a scene in the 1926 film Battleship Potemkin. And that's why that scene has to be that way because throughout the movie, I, I, I want to pay, I want to, to honor my cinematic predecessors. And so, okay, that's okay. And so, so, so you know, the, no five minutes of the movie goes by without historical right. errors or, or kind of conflations. Mm -hmm. But what he said to me is he said, you know, I don't care about any individual fact being right. He said, what I care about is, is the overall theme correct? That the Irish were discriminated against and persecuted and literally had to fight for their rights in America. He said, he said, that's true, right? And I said, that's absolutely true. And he said, well, so I've chosen the way to cinematically convey that theme. And as long and 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 as a result, I don't care about the individual scenes so long as the, the viewer ends the movie thinking, huh, I didn't know the Irish had to do that. And so and I get that. And so I I, I think that's fine. Interesting. Yeah, I like the page <laughs> by page um, uh, description there. It's really interesting way um, uh, to capture that. Um, another viewer asks, um, when did the five points end as a neighborhood, um, right? Which is interesting that the, the geography to some extent still exists, um, but I guess maybe the, the term when people thought, you know, the, the popular image, how long did people think about it as a, as a, as a place called the Five Points? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so New Yorkers stopped using that term in kind of the 1880s. So hmm. as long as it was an Irish neighborhood, they referred to it as Five Points. By the 1880s, it's become more Italian than Irish. And soon by the 1890s, it's even more Chinese than Irish. And so as a result, um, New Yorkers start referring to it as Little Italy and Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And because it's not Irish anymore, they, they, you know, they associate five points Irish. And so since it's not Irish, right. they don't think of it as five points. And the other thing that happens is they, um, in the 1870s, they cut one of the, they cut through some of the tenements and build another street through the neighborhood. And so that takes what had been the five cornered intersection and makes it no longer five cornered. So now there's no reason to call it five points since there aren't five corners at that intersection anymore. And so, so that's another reason the name drops off, but it's mostly because Little Italy and Chinatown seem to better reflect how New Yorkers oh, view right. the neighborhood. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, another interesting question that's yeah maybe not um, uh, exactly the same, but I think dovetails with that one, which is you know about whether or not there are any kind of landmarks remaining from the era in which you were talking, right? That the neighborhood was known as Five Points that remain today. If somebody were to go um, to that area right now, could they could they see anything that? Um, was a quote unquote five points landmark as you might describe it, I guess. So there aren't too many, but there are a couple. So my favorite is 65 Mott Street. Mm. So if you go to Mott Street, 
and go to number 65, which is half a block south of Canal Street. Um, and it's on the west side of the street, you will see a seven story tenement. And it, it's very rare to see st seven story tenements. What's even more interesting about this is this tenement was built in the 1820s. So well, well before most uh, landlords had built brick tenements. So this was a landlord who early on decided, I'm gonna squeeze as many people onto my lot as possible. So he built not only a seven story tenement in the front of the lot that had 20, you know, probably 26 apartments and two stores, but then he built a five story tenement right behind the, the uh, seven story tenements. This is all on this 25 by 100 foot lot. So there's a seven story building and a five story building wow. on a 25 by 100 foot lot. The five story building is so narrow because it's only 25 by 25 that it mm -hmm. only has two apartments per floor. So if you go stand on Mott Street, stand on the east side and look over at, you know, crane your head up. In the 19th century, that was said to be the first purpose built tenement ever in New mm -hmm. York City, mm -hmm. the first building that a person ever built for the purpose of being a tenement. Because keep in mind those, those uh, frame buildings we talked about before had originally been single family homes that had been converted. And so you can see this building that now we are getting very close to its 200th anniversary. Right, sure. We don't yeah. know, you know, this, the, the, this, the, depart, the building records don't go back that far. So we don't have proof that it was built in 1822 or whatever the, the year is I say in the book, it's been a while now. Um, but in the 1870s, the New York Times reported on the building and said this building was built uh, in 1822 or uh, again, whatever I say in the book. And right, right. And so that's, I, I think, a great landmark because it's, um, and you know, the, the shame is, is that back in the 1990s, you could just, you know, walk into the building and look around and see, and, 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 and you know, people kept their doors open. So when I was working on Five Points, I would walk in there all the time and just peek in to get a sense of what, how crowded would a, an apartment in Five Points have been. Um, and you know now they lock the door and you can't you can't do that anymore. But um, but that's one of my my favorite landmarks. The other I would say is to go to the corner of so this would be what's now the corner of Baxter and Worth Streets. Mm -hmm. On the south side there is the courthouse at 500 Pearl Street, which is the federal courthouse. Right. But if you stand with your back to the courthouse at that corner and look north that's the block that we saw in the photograph of the brick building and the, the woodcut. Mm -hmm. That's what's in front of you there is the intersection that was five points. Right. And none of the buildings that were on Baxter Street are still there. But if you look across the park to Mulberry Street, you can see buildings that are still there. And, you know, on Mott Street and much of Mulberry, in most of Mulberry Street, all the brick tenements that are on Mulberry and Mott, um, most of the buildings on Mulberry and Mott were there 150 years ago. Um, and so that's another great way to get a sense of five months. But so that corner, which was the five points intersection that gave it its name and 65 Mott are my two favorites. Well, I think that's really fitting, right? That um, the, the remaining uh, quote unquote landmarks are, um, our tenements and 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 um, you know multi multifamily dwellings really the, the kind of quintessential housing um, uh, that that in part helped give the neighborhood its um, its sort of depart its character there so I think that's um, that's really um, yeah sort of telling and and fitting and so you know we're we're at at um, the end of our time together so I want to um, thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, answering, you know, all these questions from viewers and uh, all of my questions and, and really delving into, um, you know, the book. It's such a, um, you know, it was really great for me to, to revisit the book. I had a lot of fun uh, doing so and can't wait to, uh, to, to read um, uh, your, your book about the famine immigrants. Uh, so, so thank you. And I want to thank all of our viewers as well for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, submitting questions and, and, and tuning in. Uh, we wanna uh, invite you to please consider 
uh, donating to the Tenement Museum, you can find a link via the chat. Of course, uh, again, uh, if you're interested in purchasing the Five Points book, uh, you can see a link in the chat to our online shop. And stay, please stay tuned uh, for additional uh, virtual events and uh, book talks by signing up for our newsletter on tenement.org. Uh, hope you'll join us again. Take care and good night. Thanks again, Tyler. Um, have a good evening. Thanks so much for having me.